All right, before I start with the number vectorized, um, quick summary on the um, local and remote task parallel. Those of you that actually got to the remote, uh, the sorry, not remote, the local task parallel, might have noticed that the matrix matrix multiplication with more tasks actually gets slower. That's partly because NumPy is very well optimized. That's one reason. So when I just use NumPy on the entire matrix, it's as fast as the processor can make it. If I make smaller matrices, that doesn't gain me anything. Um, that's one part of the problem. So you're actually just increasing the number of tasks, which increases the overhead. Each of these lines actually measures the entire matrix matrix multiplication. The second part that um, actually does, the load balance view doesn't help us here because each of these matrix matrix multiplications is running at the same speed, takes exactly the same time. So I'm not gaining anything by actually balancing the load with different length tasks. If, on the other hand, I have something that runs, um, that has a very different task duration, then the load balance view can help me optimize or use my parallel resources optimally. All right, we're going to switch topics again completely, actually going away from, not quite, but, no, we're going to continue parallel, but on a different level. Um, start the recording? Or have you already? Okay. All right. We talked about vectorize. And Olaf mentioned in the introduction to NumPy that NumPy vectorize does not, well, it vectorizes functions but doesn't make them fast. So let's take a simple trig function here. Um, I'm importing it from the math module. Whoops. That was too fast. Hmm. Let me go back to the beginning. Okay. Sine A cos B. So this calculates the product of two trig trigonomic functions. Um, we don't have this function implemented in NumPy. So what I get here is a function that takes two numbers, A and B, calculates the sine of A and the cosine of B, multiplies it, and returns the result. All right. What happens if I pass a NumPy array to this function? Like this. What do you think will happen? Any guesses? It will throw an error. It will throw an error. Why? Okay, he said, by definition, generic Python functions don't work on NumPy arrays. And that is true. Um, only a size one array can be converted to Python scalar, and this function that we defined here acts on Python scalars. Yes, exactly. But I would like to use it in a vectorized version. Here comes NumPy vectorize to the rescue. It's applied like this. Um, it actually is a function that returns, or that takes a function as an argument and returns a function. In Python, these things are also known as decorators. Um, decorators do exactly this. And we'll get to decorators in just a second. All right, NumPy vectorize. All right, so this is not very fast. Because what it does, it actually creates a wrapper that loops over all the elements in our um, NumPy ND array, applies the function to each element, and builds a new ND array that it returns. 
It's all pure Python code. So we lose one advantage of our vectorization that we usually want when we do um, when we do vectorized computations in Python, the speed. So what can we do about that? Number to the rescue. Number um, is developed by um, Continuum Analytics, also a brainchild of um, Travis Oliphant, who also developed NumPy. And it's a just-in-time compiler for Python. It takes Python code and compiles it to machine code. There is no C or something like that in between. And one of the functions that it has is a vectorization function. Let's start with dynamic U funks. If I, this looks just like it did before, right? Instead of the numpy vectorize, and I have the number vectorize, I'm applying it to the sine A cosine B function, and it returns a new function. And this is significantly faster. This time, um, it actually does it all in machine code. So it compiles a function that um, acts on a NumPy array, does the loop in a machine code representation, could even vectorize it. In this case, I mean um, sim dies it, so do a single instruction, multiple data on it, so we can feed our larger and larger SIMD units in our processors with this. And one thing that is really cool about it is just as flexible as before. I can give it any kind of ND array and it will be able to apply it as long as it can calculate the cosine and the sine of the individual elements, yes. Can you use it with things that are not ND arrays? Can you use it with things that are not ND arrays, yes. Um, but it might not want to do, might not do what you think. So the vectorize in principle is meant for ND arrays. Does the output have to have the same shape like For U funks, yes. The other version is generalized U funks, they exist too and they're no. I call this dynamic because it can take different kinds of arguments. Um, actually, I guess I have to rekind. Um, vectorize may actually just take ND arrays. Number and principle can do the same thing also with lists. I have to double check. So the vectorized function that we saw there actually compiles the first time it's called with a particular um, type of ND array. This can generate overhead at a time in my code where I don't want it. I suddenly have something that takes 100 times longer, only once, but still. <clears throat> so I can actually compile my code beforehand, and here I'm using the vectorize actually as a decorator, at number vectorize, and I pass it a list of input-output definitions. I'm returning float 8 here, and here I have as input um, to 64-bit um, integers, here I do it for a single precision floating point number, and here I do it for double precision floating point number, and I say that no Python is true. The math functions actually don't require holding the gill. So I can um, execute code that use the math functions without the gill, which means I can do them in parallel. 
So this will now compile three different versions of this function um, at this point in time. If you have used C++ templates, um, this is very similar. Once the template is, um, this would be a template specialization if you want. Vectorize also has a target keyword. Target CPU is the default. It simply creates fast, single-threaded code to run this function. But there's also a target parallel, which will actually use multiple threads and generate a ufunc that basically does your vectorized opera operation about as fast as your processor can probably do it. And if you think that your CPU is not fast enough, you can also do the um, target CUDA, which will then run it on a CUDA-enabled um, GPU. So this, for example, will generate those three functions for um, the target parallel. So it will be a multi-threaded version. <clears throat> and in the notebook, you'll actually try them out and compare the different speeds of these. And once you're done with that, you will be working on a vectorized version, this time with vectorize, of the Mandelbrot set. So here's our escape time algorithm again. It's the same one we had yesterday, so you should be familiar with it. And actually the exercise looks almost the same, except that this time you'll be writing um, a function, a vectorized functions. You can change these intervals to fit the, your previous ones if you want. Um, a vectorized function for the escape time algorithm that you can then apply to your array. And that will return an array of the same, same shape, but maybe in terms of integers. The notebook is called um, number vectorize. There's a second notebook once you're done with that. Um, that's called number intro, which is, however, an introduction to the number JIT compiler. Number uses LLVM in the background. Who has heard of LLVM before? Okay, not that many. Who has heard of Clang before? A few more. Clang uses LLVM in the background for compiling code. Who has used CUDA before? Okay. CUDA uses LLVM or can use LLVM as compiler backend. So LLVM is, a, is the low-level virtual machine. And in the end, it's a compilation and optimization framework where I have multiple front ends which compile my source code into an intermediate representation. And then this intermediate representation runs through multiple optimizers and then through a backend, which will generate machine code for different kind of processors like an Intel CPU or an NVIDIA GPU or an AMD GPU. Now, these, the first front ends that were developed or some of the first front ends that were developed were Clang and, and Clang++, which is basically a C and C++ compiler. There's Flang in the meantime for Fortran. Um, and Namba actually uses this infrastructure to take a small portion, usually, some kernel of your code, some function of your code, um, and compile it into machine code. It knows how to handle ND array, but also lists, for example, and quite a few other Python functions. 
it will has a fallback mode where it will, if it can't do anything else, just call the appropriate C Python code, which then doesn't give you a nice speed up, but still might work. Um, and it can really shine, actually, if you have something where you were expressing it, it in a looped version and um, instead of a vectorized version, but really one fast code from Python because it can deal with those very well. So that's what the second notebook is about, the JIT compiler, and now it's up to you and your time to work. Question, yeah? Uh, no, just 